I'm Chet Haas from the Android Developer Relations team. Welcome to Now in Android number 13. So 13 is weird. Hotels don't feel like posting that floor because people don't like the number 13, some sort of superstitious thing. If you have that issue with 13, like if you avoid 13th floor, the last donut in a baker's dozen, or when you're just counting by one and you pass 12 before you get to 14. If you have a problem with it, you can skip this episode and just come back when we have number 14 next time around, and then just pretend that since it's software, there was an off by one error, if that works for you. In the meantime, tons of things have happened in the last couple of weeks. There's a lot to cover, so go ahead and crank this video or podcast up to 2x, and let's get rolling. First of all, obviously, Android 11 is out on the streets now, so developer preview one. When we first did developer previews, Lollipop was the first release that we did that. It was a really good idea. It was a really poor implementation because things were undergoing massive churn at the same time as we released that. And then since then, in the releases, many releases since then, we sort of learned how to do it better and better. We get it out there in a fairly stable form so that we can get your feedback and then react to it. Uh, this one is coming out even earlier than we have in earlier releases. So that means that there should be more time for you to actually play with it and react to it. So please do that. Go ahead and download it. You can install it on any of the Pixel 2, 3, or 4 devices if you want to put it on a developer device, or just use the emulator in the, the, in the Android Studio tool. That will work as well. So play with it, test out your app, make sure things behave the way that you think they should. Some of the features that are worth thinking about in the new release that are in the developer preview are support for 5G. Uh, this includes some new APIs that allow you to check the unmetered, <laughs> unmetered status and with the bandwidth capabilities that come with uh, that new network capability. Bubbles was a feature that was introduced in Android 10, kinda. It came out, but it came out under uh, the guise of a developer option. So a user had to enable to actually see bubbles. So we got a little bit of testing. Hopefully you got a little bit of testing if you wanted the feature, but it wasn't really a real feature for users. Now it is. It's an official API that you can and should use for UI about messages, about uh, contact information that you want to propagate to the overall UI on the device one-time permission. So there was a tri-state location permission that we introduced in Android 10, the ability to ask the user, do you want to enable this permission or deny this permission or only enable it when this application is in the foreground? That was a really good idea. Users like that, they use that uh, a lot and we want to take that a step further. So not just running in the foreground, but do you want to use this while the application is running in the foreground in this session only? So it's not like a turn this thing on and then the app has it forever. It is turn it on because I recognize that it needs to be used right now and then disable uh, after that foreground usage. Uh, not only are we going to have that for location, but we're also turning on that permission capability for microphone and camera usage as well. Scope storage, we're taking that a notch further than it went in Android 10. We're enabling some new capabilities that are interesting, hopefully make it a little bit easier to use some of the stuff and more powerful. Uh, you have the ability to do batched edits and also access to raw files and paths. Uh, there's been some new biometric prompt APIs uh, according to some of the new capabilities that are out there uh, for some of the new devices in the world. Uh, and we've also folded those in for compatibility APIs into the biometric Android X library. So check out those APIs. Uh, and data blobs, I think that is probably my new favorite word in software. Blob apparently stands for binary large object, but I just like it as the word blob. Data blobs are large chunks of data that you can download and install for use between multiple apps. So let's say you have a massive ML model, you want to put it on the device and you have multiple apps that want to access that data. You don't need to install it for both of them. Instead, you can use the blob store manager API uh, to share that data around. So check out Android 11, uh, download the dev developer preview and play with that. On with the show, Android X releases, there were some basically bug fix releases that came out for Fragment, Media 2, Room, and Transition. All of those are stable in their current version now. Um, mostly bug fixes, but also the Fragment library had some interesting lint checks that you might want to check out. 
Uh, next, Android Studio. So we had a couple of interesting releases there. Uh, I've talked about both of these releases in previous now in Androids. Um, but first of all, we had 3.6 that finally went stable. So now you can get all of those features we've been talking about already, except in the stable version. So if you're holding back, waiting for it to actually be the full release thing, now is the time. Um, some of the new things that you may be interested in there include easier leak detection. Uh, can be a complicated task, especially if you have to download files and run specialized tools. So that is much easier now in 3.6. Also, split view for code and design. So if you're editing a resource file, an XML resource file, typically you would see it in code, or you could use a design tool when that's available, but one or the other. Now you can actually see both at the same time, so you can sort of see the changes that you make to either format uh, and uh, see them reflected in the other one. Pretty useful. Um, emulator improvements uh, for working with both location as well as multi-display situations, and view binding, which we're going to hear about soon. This is a new capability in 3.6. You need the new tool to use this thing that essentially replaces the need for find view by ID and all of that boilerplate code. Also, 4.0 went beta, so you can either use the full release of 3.6, or if you want to be slightly more on the leading edge, you can use 4.0. So check that out. The motion editor I've talked about uh, here before, the ability to actually use a visual tool for creating these powerful UI animations uh, with the constraint layout subclass. Um, or also Jetpack Compose. If you want to see what we're doing with the new UI capabilities in that library, still uh, pre-alpha, still pretty early, uh, still undergoing changes, uh, but you will need 4.0 if you want to play with that. So if you want to do the tutorial and sample code that we have online um, or play around with any of the ideas and some of the talks and articles that have been posted about that. Uh, next, background location. So what are the three most important things for user privacy? It's got to be location, location, location. right? So it's really important to make sure that the user not only gives the appropriate permission when their location is going to be used, but also knows what's going on in the system. There have been a bunch of changes for privacy in the last few releases where we are trying to make that clearer to the user and to developers exactly what the rules are and uh, when applications and developers can get access to that location and how the user can find out that that uh, access is happening and either grant or deny it. Uh, appropriately. Um, so we are continuing to make uh, changes uh, in location uh, with you know each release, make sure that this is the right thing to do for users. And we created a new guide. We know that it can be complicated to deal with all this information, make sure that you know while I, I actually do need the location in the background, how do I get that location? How do I propagate that information to the user? Um, so there's a new guide on the site that you should check out. This link, as all links uh, that I talk about, I'm not going to give you a URL. That would be silly. Uh, instead, go to the article. Now in Android number 13, all of the links are in there. So if you like what you hear in the video, go to the article, check it out, click on the link. All right, next up, dynamic feature modules. So this is a really powerful feature. If you want to decrease the size of the initial download and install, make it easier and faster for users to actually get your applications, wouldn't it be nice if you could put things in optional modules so that they didn't have to come down on first install. Instead, they can come down later You know when and if they're actually needed. So all of that's great. But testing those was a little bit tricky. You actually needed to upload a bundle to the Play Store in order to test the flow. So Wojtek Kalichinski has works on uh, with the PlayCore team and on a new version of the PlayCore library to make that a lot easier. There's an article about that uh, that he wrote. Um, you'll need 1.6.5 of the PlayCore library. I think that's currently in alpha. And there's also new documentation that talks about this stuff to make it easier for you to do the testing that you need need to do with dynamic feature modules. Next up, material motion. So the material design team has posted a new guide for dealing with motion with material. So animation is really powerful, right? In particular, it's really good at helping users understand transitions between potentially complicated UIs, right? If you can actually bring the user from one state to the other, then they can go on that journey with you instead of trying to figure out where they are now and how they got there. 
So that's the good part. The bad part is it can be really complicated to implement these things. Lots of APIs, lots of libraries, lots of approaches for doing these things and guides from the material team, but somehow it wasn't obvious how you could do some of this stuff. So they've come out with a new guide that's more specific about uh, doing things like activity transitions. Uh, not only that, but they've also enhanced the uh, material components library uh, with transitions capabilities. So you can actually start from their library, from their APIs, and these built-in capabilities to build in those transitions into your own application. So check out the new documentation, the guide, uh, and the article, and certainly the library for that. There's been a few articles posted that are uh, worth checking out for developers. Nick Butcher had a couple of articles posted. He has an ongoing series called Android Styling, where he's talking about themes and attributes and styles and how they differ and how they're the same and how you should use them. So he's got two articles there this last time. Common theme attributes, it's how you should use these theme attributes for things like colors, uh, common things that you're doing instead of hard coding that information. And then the next one is uh, called Prefer Theme Attributes. Again, sort of harping on that same theme of using attributes. Um, for common things like colors in your app instead of using uh, resource references. Uh, so they, they provide a lot more flexibility as well as semantic clarification for your application, your code. Uh, and then also, Sean McQuillan posted an article on view binding. So I mentioned this earlier for the 3.6 release. Now you can use view binding instead of find view by ID. In, in fact, we kind of recommend it. You, you should use this. It really cleans up your code and is a better approach than some of the other approaches out there. Uh, so now you can use it in the full release of that tool. And now with Sean's article, you can find out how you actually do this, how it works, uh, and how you can integrate it into your application. Uh, biometric prompt, um, there's a new article uh, from Isai Damier, uh, which talks about uh, how biometrics uh, relates to cryptography. They are not the same thing, but they can work together to make sure that they protect your data uh, in, in a very secure way. So there's uh, an article that he wrote, and then there's a sample link um, from that article as well that you can check out. Uh, speaking of biometrics, uh, Isai also wrote a new sample for biometric login. Um, so if you are trying to figure out how to integrate biometrics and biometric login into your application, be sure to check that out. And then finally, we have some new videos out there. Nick Butcher posted a long-ish video on vector assets. So we as a developer relations team and engineers here, we'll go out and we'll give these conference talks and you know write these slides, sort of encapsulate our thoughts about how things work into a presentation, give that presentation at a conference. Hopefully it's recorded and then hopefully it's posted, but there's sort of this diminishing uh, returns of like, well, how big is the audience that saw it, that saw the video posted? Um, we thought for some of the more important things that we do, why don't we actually re-record those in an optimized way in the studio and then post that and share it on the channel to make sure that all the information gets out there to all the developers that want it. So the first one of these that we're doing is this talk that Nick Butcher did recently on vector assets. It's about using vector format instead of the more traditional sort of PNG format for images. That way you can get these resizable sharp images and you can also uh, have powerful ways of animating those images over time using things like vector drawable and animated vector drawable. So this talk covers the technical details of that. And then there's also a video from Florina Montanescu uh, where she talks about sealed classes, a uh, nice language feature from Kotlin. It has capabilities that are similar to Enum's, but builds in a lot more flexibility than uh, Enum's give you. So you only want a, a standards and constrained set of values, but you want more capabilities from subclassing, uh, from uh, just more flexibility in general than the, the sort of uh, data structure format uh, that Enum's allow you. So that's it for this time. Uh, we'll be back next time. And in the meantime, if you liked what you heard, uh, go ahead and share and like the video, and please subscribe to the Android Developers channel on YouTube. Thanks.